I say the last day of my business school class every year, everybody that graduates in that class could be CEO of GE or Goldman Sachs or almost anything they put their mind to. But in order to do that, you have to, you have to answer three questions, right? How fast can I learn? How much am I willing to put up with, right? To persevere. And how much am I willing to give to others, right? Those three questions. And those are more about hard work and perseverance than they are about raw IQ. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Future of Work. I am your host, Jacob Morgan, and today I am joined by Jeff Immelt, the former CEO of GE and the author of a brand new book called The Hot Seat, What I Learned from Leading a Great American Company. Jeff, thank you for joining me. Jacob, nice to meet you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Oh, yes. I There is so much stuff in here. I took more notes from your book than probably I have from any other <laughs> guest that I've interviewed over the years. There's just so much fascinating stuff in there. Uh, but let's start off with a little bit of background information about you and how you actually became the the CEO of GE. So take us way back, even how you were raised, how you grew up and, and what that path looked like for you. Yeah, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, my dad was a lifelong GE employee in the aviation business. So really a typical uh, middle class upbringing. I was kind of a combination of a math nerd and a football player. So mm -hmm. I, I always liked problem solving, even at an early age. And I played lots of team sports in high school and in college. In college, I was like a physics and math major and a uh, uh, football player. So that kind of continued through college. I, I ran out of money and needed to work a little bit. So I joined uh, P&G for two years before business school. My office mate was Steve Ballmer. Our desks touched each other. So uh, Steve and I have been friends for almost 40 years. Uh, I went to business school and graduated in 1982. And that started my journey in uh, GE. I, I started in sales, selling plastics in the automotive industry. I, I was promoted several times in that business early on and kind of sales and marketing product management. I went to work in GE's appliance business and learned how to fix compressors and ran a service business during a real a big product recall. Uh, then I ran our healthcare business in the late 90s. So I kind of moved around a lot. I did different uh, technical and, and commercial kinds of jobs and uh, lived through cycles and failure and crises and globalization, things like that. And uh, in 20 years after I joined, I became CEO of the company. So, you know, a little bit of experience, a little bit of luck, a little bit of performance. That's kind of how most careers are built. It's funny, as I was going through your book, uh, the people who you surround yourself with, you know, the, the dinners that you had with various people uh, who you grew up with, people like Steve Almar, it reminded me of... Um, you know, those those athletes who are now really famous, who always tell stories of back in the day when they were, uh, you know, coming up in their careers and they were surrounded by all these other famous athletes. I mean, you were surrounded by an all star team of <laughs> of young business leaders who ended up changing the world. It, it's really fascinating. Um, you know, Jacob, I, I tell people, like, always be nice, always treat people with respect the first time you meet them. Yeah. Uh, be nice to them. Like the first time I met Jamie Dimon was on a basketball floor. We were oh, competitors, man. right? And and so we became friends. Steve, Steve and I were drinking mates. Like we were both too immature <laughs> to be business people, but we were like partiers and drinking mates. So you never know how life's going to turn out. So it always behooves you just be nice to the people you're with. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, one of the things that you actually talked about in your book is that how you were, there was a time during your life when you were actually pretty broke and you were living, as you said, in a, in a closet. Can you talk a little bit about what that time was like for you and what was going on? Yeah, I mean, you know, so I, I kind of went to school, worked a little bit, then went to business school. And when I was in business school, I kind of ran out of money. So we, we lived four people in a three bedroom place and we kind of hived off the back of the apartment that could fit a bed and a small desk. And that was my uh, living arrangement. And that helped me 
you know, be able to save money, I got to pay the least rent. And uh, I had a Visa card that had a $300 limit. And it was, I had maxed it to like $3,000. So I was using, <laughs> and then I would pay like $12 a month. So I was using the float of a credit card to kind of get me through the, the moment in time uh, when I was most in debt. Uh, then I signed a balloon note when I graduated from business school, $25,000. And none of it was due for five years. Hmm. So then I get married. My wife and I, we have a young child. We have a baby. The five years comes up right before Christmas. And my wife says, you know, we got a bill today for $25,000. <laughs> and I said, shit, I knew I forgot something. Sorry oh, about that. Man. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what it, you know, you do what it takes when you're young. Yeah. At the very beginning of your book, you said that you almost didn't write this book. Uh, why did you actually end up writing it? Yeah, so my career didn't end uh, the way I wanted it to, for sure. And I moved to California uh, because I needed to heal and decided to get into venture and do teaching and things like that. And, you know, I, I was just unhappy. I felt like the whole narrative around GE had been lost and that, you know, truth equals really facts plus context. And I felt like the context had been lost. So one of the reasons why I wrote it is I wanted to tell a more complete story. I, I didn't want it to be defensive. I wanted to, it to be complete. And the other thing is in the, in the subsequent three or four years, you know, I, I now teach at the business school at Stanford. And I, I find that the students, you know, they don't want like the seven pearls of leadership and look at me, I'm perfect. You know, they've lived through the financial crisis and COVID. They want to know how you figure it out when it doesn't work, how you survive mm -hmm. through volatility. And so I felt like there was an audience, you know, even people that didn't care about GE, there was an audience for a book that was really about persevering through crisis. So those are really the two reasons why I wrote the book. I took my time. I hired a great co-author. She spoke to 80 people and it was uh, it was a real process. Yeah, you, as you talk about in the book, many people have been very critical of you over the years. Uh, and even, you know, today, a lot, I even saw people online very critical. Some of the interviews that you've done, people have been very, very critical of you. And I find that especially now in the age of social media, it's very easy to be critical of somebody um, and to quickly just jump out and, and say something. But for all the people out there who have been critics of you over the years, if there's a particular message that you wanted them to get from the book, what would that message be? Yeah, that there were there were people in this company that tried their best and actually did perform pretty well, right? If you look at cumulative earnings, market share, you know, if you go back to 2016, this was a top 20 market cap company. It was number seven on Fortune Most Admired. It was number one on uh, companies to to hire leaders. We were leaders in digitization and globalization, you know. But the stock didn't work. Uh, succession planning didn't work. There were things that didn't work. And to your point, we live kind of in a world without nuance. Yep. And and you know, it would be one thing, you know, Jacob, if the story, the way the story was was told, or the criticism was just at me. But there's hundreds, if not thousands, of people that have been hurt through this whole process. And, you know, I, I had the means to kind of help correct that. And that's what I tried to do. And of course, you worked with one of the most famous CEOs in history who passed away fairly recently, Jack Welsh. What was it like to take over for, I mean, even today, he's probably considered to be one of the most famous legendary CEOs, right? The CEO of the century, as he was called. Uh, what was it like working with Jack and then also taking over for Jack? Yeah, so let me handle the first one first. Working for Jack was great fun. I, I thought he was challenging. He was giving. He was creative. Um, I think he liked to curry this image of, you know, uh, Neutron Jack, tough as nails, things like that. But But that wasn't the person I saw. I saw a person that was always challenging and always um, uh, completely giving in what he did. I, I, I would still say, Jacob, that, you know, he was really one of the best leaders I've ever seen at running something at scale, right? He, he created an aura. He was a great communicator to, to 300,000 people to one person. He was fantastic in all those uh, activities and all those things. 
But by the end of the 90s, it was a company where perception didn't equal reality. We were 50% financial, 50% kind of an old industrial company. Um, we traded like Amazon at a, at a 50 PE. And so kind of following him, you know, the, the trick was to drive the appropriate kind of change while never looking backwards and never casting blame. And, and, uh, and that's challenging. Look, it's easier to follow a jerk than it is to follow, you know, the best leader of the previous century, right? <laughs> yeah. But I, I never wanted to be him. I never wanted to act like him. And I felt like the company needed change. Yeah, he's a very, I think he was called a celebrity CEO at the time. Uh, so I'm curious to hear your perspective. If Do you think his leadership style and approach would work in an organization today? Because I think there's been a lot that has changed over the years. Would a, would a Jack Welsh thrive inside of an organization today? Look, I think there are elements of what, the way he led, you know, his focus on people, his focus on metrics that are timeless, right? There, there are elements of kind of short-termism. I, I don't think he ever respected technology, really. Um, you know, there are elements of his leadership that just didn't, uh, wouldn't travel today. You know, it was, yeah. I, I remember him saying, to Jake, many times, like, don't do anything unless you can control it, right? Don't do mm -hmm. anything unless you can control it. Today, you control nothing if you're a CEO of a public company. So I, I think, you know, the trick with every generation of leadership is to pick the things that travel, that work, and pick the new things that have to be part of, uh, you know, making making a company vibrant and competitive in the next generation. And so I, I think that's the way I would assess how much would work and how much wouldn't work in this generation. Can you talk about the the relationship that you had with him over the years and how it ended up ending? Because I think towards, uh, I think it was the end or the beginning of the book, you talk about how, you know, you fought with him, you loved him, you admired him. But then there's also this really, I thought, sad story. It's kind of like something that you would expect in a movie where uh, at his funeral, you said that you were quietly standing in the, in the back of the pews uh, while other people were giving this eulogy. So it sounds like it wasn't always easy. And you guys did have, at times, a, a tough, intense relationship. Yeah, look, I learned a lot from him and I had immense affection for him as a leader growing up in the company. Uh, in the early days of my CEO tenure, we had a good relationship. Uh, in, in 2008, at the beginning of the financial crisis, um, you know, I missed our earnings numbers right at the beginning. I mean, you couldn't see the crisis that was yet to unfold. This was in the very early days, but it clearly was what impacted our numbers. And, you know, he went on CNBC and really dramatically uh, criticized me. And that was kind of the line of demarcation in our relationship, right? You know, uh, I was respectful. I never talked at all about anything in the company and flaws. That was one moment when I really needed a friend and he chose not to be a friend. And so I would say from that point onward, we had a cordial relationship. Whenever I was troubled about anything, I would call him, even times when we weren't having a good relationship. But I, but I would say, you know, I, I respected him at that point. I, I leaned on him sometimes for, for questions, but we weren't close uh, over that, you know, let's say the subsequent uh, decade. And then, you know, what I mentioned in the funeral was, you know, like like when when he died and, and and at his funeral, all the people that basically, you know, kissed his butt when he was alive and when he was CEO, they all turned their back on him. The the in the yeah. media, you know, when he died, and and I found that to be a uh, sad. Yeah, no, I mean the way that you talked about it in the book, I mean it, it it was I think very sad. One of the people who I think has been very very critical of Jack Welsh over the years has been Simon Sinek, of course, the leadership author. And I don't know if you saw this or were this, but he, uh, I think at one point he even said people like, I don't know if he said Jack Welsh specifically, but I think he said leaders like Jack Welsh, he actually used the word bastards. And he said that people like Jack Welsh are the ones who are responsible for mass layoffs of greed, of being selfish. Do you agree? Is that, is that true? Look, I, I think Jack drove 
productivity. He drove hard, uh, a hard message about financial stewardship and responsibility. And he wasn't afraid to make uh, tough calls, right? Yeah. So, so you know, to a certain extent, I, I think um, it, get la- it gets laid at his feet in the context of restructuring, outsourcing, things like that. But, but it was really kind of the genre of the, of, the, of the era, right? The 80s and 90s were kind of the peak of U.S. CEOs really believing and, and thinking and, and feeling like they could do whatever they wanted to do and probably, you know, get, a, get away with it, right? In, in terms of not outside the rules, but in terms of, you know, driving efficiencies and things like that. So, you know, that, that's how Jack gets, uh, mm-hmm. gets cast. Look, what was he good at? He was good at developing uh, human resources, developing people, putting metrics in front of companies and being really uh, sustaining things like productivity. I think what, what could you be critical about him of is that, you know, he just wasn't towards the end of his career, you know, really focused on technology and, and, uh, and many of the practices that were put in place in the 80s and 90s had to be changed in the 2000s and the 2000 teens. And that's not his fault. It's just the, 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 you know, kind of the social zeitgeist has changed so dramatically. And I don't think leaders can blame the past. They just have to pivot and do things differently in this generation. Do you remember during, and I'm just curious for historical context, were layoffs a thing even before Jack Walsh? I mean, do your career, do you remember? You know, I really don't know because that was kind of the world I grew up in. But, yeah. you know, it's just, it's just, uh, there were there were just too many inefficiencies, and I don't think anybody can blame uh, leaders for not being efficient. I think people can blame leaders for not being innovative, and that's mm-hmm. really the line I would try to draw, both in the book and the way I talk about the company uh, externally. So before we shift gears and focus um, to you, uh, maybe one last question about about Jack. Is there a favorite Jack Welsh story that that comes to mind? Uh, you had a couple in the book. Uh, is there one in particular that that you love sharing with people, whether it's from the book or something that's not in the book? So, so one is like, and these are both more or less in the book, but attention to detail, right, and and willingness to jump over boundaries to get his will done. Uh, I was in the plastics business as a sales manager. We had to go to General Motors and get a price increase. I'm with four of my sales reps in a car, in a Taurus, in the General Motors parking lot. The phone rings, those old block phones that would be in a car. He, he, I answer the phone, it's Jack Walsh. Now he's my boss's 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 boss. And he says, Jeffrey, put me on the speaker. And so I put him on the speaker and here he, he's got like five salespeople and he's lecturing us on, you got to get 10 cents a pound. You got to do this. You got to do that. I love and your I Jack Wells was, voice. <laughs> in his voice. It was remarkable, <laughs> uh, his attention to detail. The other one is just his ability to talk to different people in different ways. I, I was in, I was running the medical business. This was maybe a decade later. Uh, we had had a tough meeting. He really kicked my ass. Then we went next door to meet with the union leadership and he was a different guy. He was the charming Irishman and, you know, was totally charmed them. And his ability to see different audiences and play them different ways, I thought was remarkable. And, and as you can see, and as I tried to describe in the book is I had a great affection for him, but he wasn't perfect. And it was a tough, he was a tough guy to follow. One story that came out or that I remember from the book, I think you were you were sharing something where you had to present data uh, to Jack and there was somebody with you, like a, a statistician, somebody who's doing analysis and somebody went and presented before him and Jack like tore this person to pieces. And the stats guy was so scared. He, so he did just did not present anything and you took over for him. I took over. Yeah. It was, you know, we were paying, we were, we were presenting failure curves, which are logarithmic tables and, he was a statistician, so he was particularly useful in that. And so I started presenting his charts 
But, you know, so this went, this was really like two or three or four tense hours. But then I'm walking out of the room afterwards and he grabs me by the arm and says, look, you're doing a great job. Just, just so you know, you're doing a great job. Whatever you need, don't let the bureaucracy get in the way. I'm here to help you. And that was the paradox of the guy, right? Mm. Tough, but fair and fun. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've asked a couple CEOs on this show is their perception of how work has changed. Because Jack was not, you know, he would curse, he would be aggressive, you know, he was, he was very intense. And today, it seems like if you curse, if you're intense, anything like that, you know, people turn on you really quickly. And one of the questions that I asked a, a couple of CEOs, I said, do you think the world of work or the workplace in general has gotten a little, a little soft over the years? And I'm curious to hear your perspectives on that, because personally, I feel like a lot of people in today's organizations if they were in organizations in the 80s, the 90s, if they worked for people like Jack, they would have been torn to pieces. They, they wouldn't have made it. So, I mean, do you think that's true? Is that the case? Have we, have we softened up a little bit over the years? And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, just... You know, look, I, I mean, I think in, in, in some ways the intellectual, um, the intellectual content of work is greater today than it's ever been. But the, but the norms of work are softer today, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Now, now, some of that, I think, you know, Jacob, is the fact that, look, when I went to work in 1982, I actually thought I would, I could stay with the same company for 30 years, right? Yeah. And, and therefore, you know, you were more willing to give people a second chance or to say, look, I got my butt chewed today, but I'll make it up tomorrow. Now people kind of lead a more nomadic, career. And so, you know, everybody has like a half a foot out the door, maybe not, maybe not a whole body out the door, but they're, they're not planning on staying a place forever. And I think it, it means that sometimes leaders can pull punches and, 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 you know, give more of a second chance than maybe they could before. Um, but look, I think, I think Amazon has got a tough minded culture. Yeah. I think Tesla's got a tough minded culture. So the very best companies still are demanding uh, of their people. You know, one of the most famous classes at Stanford Business School is called Touchy Feely, which is like how, oh, you really? get in touch with your, how you get in touch with yourself and things like that. Oh, man. And pe the kids love it. So I think it's great. But I tell them, look, once you leave here, there's no touchy feely anymore. <laughs> it's like oh. you, yeah, you got to bring meat. I come from an immigrant family and my dad's from the, you know, former USSR. And if, if you tell him that there's a class called touchy feely, he's going to lose his marbles. Uh, <laughs> that, that would, that would not fly with Russian immigrant parents. Yeah, exactly. Um, you also had a, a story that I remember where you were talking about how, uh, there were three potential candidates who were going to be CEO. And I know you've talked about this before and Jack basically went over to you and said, Hey, if you're not chosen for CEO, you got to get the hell out of this company. Go. <laughs> and I, I was reading that and I'm like, man, there is no way that would fly today. Like that would just, no, no, oh, gosh. No, I mean, I think it was, but it was like, it was like the end of a golden age. He was the most famous CEO. Yeah. The succession process was just so public and so, and so visible that, you know, in some ways that was kind of of the era. The era today is, is, uh, look, you know, Google's a great company. Uh, uh, Larry leaves, somebody else steps up. You know, you just read about it in the newspaper the next day. It's not, it's not part of some big, uh, Olympiad or, or things like that. So I, I think that's Bezos the same way. Bezos steps out, Andy Jassy steps in. Of course, everybody cares, but it's not like it was this huge, visible uh, gladiatorial contest. I think that was just of the era. You, you had to lead through one of the greatest tragedies in American history, uh, being 9-11. And I think in the book you talk about how that was even more of a tragedy than, than COVID, and I'll let you elaborate on that. But do you remember where you were when 9-11 happened and what was going through your mind and the response that you took? Yeah, look, I was in Seattle uh, visiting Boeing, and I'm, I'm at the hotel fitness center in the morning, uh, and I watched the second plane hit the World Trade Center. So at that moment, you know, I knew something was wrong. So I, I was on the West Coast for that entire week until they let planes uh, continue to uh, fly. And you immediately, we immediately went into kind of these crisis calls, crisis sessions, 
And, um, you know, that was the first terrorist event I'd ever seen. And I would say through that process, I kind of learned that, you know, something I, I had always been pretty good at, and that's absorbing fear, that, that you're, you don't want to be an accelerant of fear. You want to be a shock absorber uh, of fear. Uh, you learn to hold two truths at the same time, that things can always get worse, but that things can also uh, have a future and you need to focus on that. Uh, you have to communicate uh, like hourly, daily, and that's, we did a lot of that. And we made decisions. You, you know, it's like, uh, there's no honeymoon for me. Uh, you just you, you just sit right down and you start making decisions and you find that some work and some don't, but in a crisis, you've got it, you've got to take action. And, and those are the things that were confronted uh, right away. We were in the commercial aviation business. We were in the insurance business. We were in the media business. All three of those businesses got rocked uh, on 9-11 and we lost two people. Yeah. How do you respond when there's no playbook? Uh, because I think the same thing happened during COVID, right? I mean, there's no playbook for a terrorist attack. There's no playbook for a pandemic yep. and you're expected to lead regardless. Yeah, I think same thing, uh, uh, the financial crisis, there was no playbook. COVID, there was no playbook. 9-11, there was no playbook. I, I think it starts with the kind of people you have around you. Do, are you surrounded by people you trust that you can talk to? And then I think you, you need to develop kind of a sense of timing. What decisions need to be made today? What decisions can can be put off? And you, you, you prioritize the decisions that need to be made. You get smarter every minute and every hour. So you want to have operating mechanisms that move quicker than, than, uh, than they would in a normal time because you're just smarter. And I think the last thing is, and, and w when you don't have a playbook, is you have to be willing, when people say wrong things about you, you have to be very contemporary with the, with the respect of owning the narrative and controlling the communication and things like that because they can set you back. So good leaders, flexible point of view, uh, learn every minute of every day and be willing to push back when people get it wrong. Have you ever been scared during your career? And I, I know obviously 9-11 uh, oh, yeah. is an, e an easy thing to point to, but I think a lot of people looked at you over the years and they thought, oh man, you know, Jeff is like a tank, nothing scares him, nothing bothers him, but they don't, you know, they don't know what's going on inside your head. So financial crisis was, if you were in financial services, uh, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy in the 30 or 60 days after that were just terrifying every day because there was so much that was not known. Um, if you're in the industry, you were viewed as a villain. So you were being vilified every day. Uh, there are a lot of people that were, you know, attacking the market and attacking stocks and things like that. Uh, the public, you know, which was, you know, for probably a generation, the government just was not a player in business, but the government became a very constructive and destructive player. And, you know, I didn't want to go to bed at night because I didn't want to wake up the next morning and have to look and see, oh, my God, what's going on the, with the market? What are people saying about us? And it went on that way for 60 or 90 days. It was just really terrifying. Hmm. What about imposter syndrome? Did you ever feel like, oh, man, I'm in over my head. I shouldn't be doing this job. I can't do it. Uh, did you ever have those yeah, types of moments? Were, there, were, there were several times where... Um, you know, I, I I doubted myself or I questioned whether some of the decisions were right. But I, I think I think leaders take this journey kind of into themselves where they they try to learn. It's kind of like self reflection, self renewal, and you 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 develop this ability to go to bed at night feeling like an abject failure. And waking up the next morning, re, you know, looking in the mirror and saying, you know, you can do it, right? Hmm. You're the best. You, you, you just have to show up, you know, keep going. And I think you've got to have these, these reservoirs of self-confidence, self-reflection, self-renewal, uh, particularly to keep going uh, in a crisis. Because really, in the financial crisis, not only was it hard, not only was... Um, were the answers uncertain, but you were just getting trashed every day. You know, I, I remember going 
in March of 2009, JP Morgan had a conference in New York City that had lots of CEOs. Charlie Rose was the interviewer. And I was being interviewed in the morning. Everybody, everybody was on the edge of their chair. I walk in, Charlie Rose has the Wall Street Journal, and he's yellow lined everything about GE, which was everything that was in the paper that day. And I can't even tell you, like, I, I, I didn't want to go. I thought about canceling, but I showed up. And, you know, those are the minutes, the moments you'd never, you never forget, really. Hmm. The importance of just showing up. How do you do that? Uh, because you, you know, a lot of people, they don't have to deal with Charlie Rose. They don't have to deal with articles being written in major publications on headlines. Uh, you know, they just don't want to deal with their manager or dealing, uh, deal with something at work. I mean, you had to deal with, you know, major things, your name, your company was all over the place. Yeah. So how do you deal with feeling that imposter syndrome, feeling like you don't want to show up and still doing it? Do you, you like know, I think talk to yourself? Uh, you've got to have just a reservoir of self-confidence. Hmm. You've got to have friends, you, you know, you need to have, you need to have people who care about you, right? That are, that are, that are coaching or cheering or picking you up. And you can only build, you know, you, you, you can only build confidence and friendships when the shit's not hitting the fan, you know, yeah. if you're waiting to the moment when you're in crisis to build friendships, uh, you've waited too long or, or to think that you can work yourself through it. So again, I think some of it's in you, but some of it's in the people you surround yourself with in terms of really, really wanting to work together, wanting to care to make it through. Between a leader who is talented versus a leader who is working hard, uh, this is one of the debates that, that keep coming up, right? Can you learn to be a better leader? Or what if some people are more talented? Who do you think has the edge there, the talented leader or the leader who's willing to work harder? Oh, gosh, I have to go with hard work mainly because change is so prevalent in the world today, right? So... You know, I, I start entered the business world in 1982, and I didn't know anything about China, nothing at all. I mean, I could find it on a map. That's about it. And if you ask me from 1982 to 2021, almost 40 years, what's one of the two or three most important things that's happened in the business world in the last 40 years? I would say the advent of China is one of them. Now, talent isn't going to give you the sense of how to participate in that market, but hard work does, right? Trip after trip, time after time, uh, trial after trial, risk after risk, you know, that's how you build capability. So I, I just think in a world of fast change, of, of amazing change, um, you know, kind of perseverance and hard work actually matters a lot. I, I say the last day of my business school class every year, everybody that graduates in that class could be CEO of GE or Goldman Sachs or almost anything they put their mind to. But in order to do that, you have to you have to answer three questions, right? How fast can I learn? How much am I willing to put up with, right, to persevere? And how much am I willing to give to others? Right. Mm -hmm. Those three questions. And those are more about hard work and perseverance than they are about raw IQ. One of my favorite questions to always ask CEOs and business leaders is how do you define leader and leadership? Because I've been given so many different definitions and explanations over the years. I'm curious to hear yours. How would you define leader and leadership to somebody who's never heard of those things? Yeah, I think I think a, a leader kind of picks what's next drives change and absorbs fear, right? Puts up, with, puts up with the crap that's important to build culture. So that's what leaders do. I think leadership is more institutional. Leadership is about vision and organization and human resources and talent development. So I, I view leadership as kind of institutional and leader is really personal. Right. And, and that's how I've always distinguished between the two. 
During the course of your career, has there been a particular, I guess you could call it a leadership hack or strategy or technique that you've used on a regular basis that think made you, that you think made you a more effective leader? Yeah, I, I sustained, I would say, external focus throughout my entire career. So it gave me a good sense for what might be next. So we were early players in globalization. We were early players in environmental investing. We were early players in digitization. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that I spent a lot of time with customers and thought leaders and scientists uh, around the world. And, and that was useful. I'd say if I could sneak in one other one of, you know, I, I always try to connect with people kind of like in their setting one on one, I, I knew how people did their work. If I was on a business trip to Australia, I would have a 1000 things going on. But I stayed in the moment to connect with those people who were on the ground there. So I'd say the, the other one I would sneak in is that I, I was a good connector. Hmm. with with people. I interviewed uh, Tim Ryan, the CEO of PwC in the United States, and he actually echoed something that you said in your book, and that's the importance of leaders having thick skin. And when I talked to Tim, he was saying that leadership now, it's, it's harder than it's ever been because there's more spotlight, there's more scrutiny, there's more change than ever before. How do you develop that thick skin? Did it just come over time? Were you ever you know, more sensitive and more defensive earlier on in your career? So I, I actually, so I, I agree with Tim, by the way, I think it's never been harder than it is right now, but I, I actually think no one has thick skin. You know, in other words, <laughs> no one has thick skin. You just choose to, you choose to take the high road, right? You, you make a choice as to what path you're going to take, but, but slights hurt, right? Criticism hurts. Um, Negativity hurts. And, and people that say that they just shrug it off, I think they're lying to themselves or to you, right? All of the things hurt, but, but you make a choice to say, look, am I going to look backwards at the, at the person or am I just going to keep moving? And uh, I, think, I think people who look like they have thick skin are, are people that have just made the choice to keep, to keep moving. Yeah, and it's not well, an I easy can choice. Probably name, you know, I've had many critics. I can probably, I can probably tell you by name who they are, but but <laughs> you know, that's a different that's a different interview. Yeah, well, actually, it, it transitions well to what I wanted to talk about next. I wanted to read something that you mentioned in your book, just to give people listening and watching a sense of the the scale of pressure that you were under. So, in your book, you said. Uh, days before I took the reins from Jack, Fortune published a piece titled, It's All Yours, Jeff, Now What? And in it, they noted that just to maintain GE's current level of, of growth, the company would have to expand by roughly $17 billion in that year, which is the equivalent of 1-3M. The next year, it would have to grow by a Federal Express and in 2003 by a Coca-Cola and Immelt thus finds himself about where Sandra Bullock was in the movie Speed, driving an enormous vehicle that, should it slow down for any reason, will blow up. That sounds intense. Um, how do you deal with that kind of pressure? You know, I, I, think, I think at that level, it almost becomes, you know, uh, you, you just can't pay attention to it in that context, right? You know, in other words, I knew Welsh's fame. I read that article in Fortune. I knew what some of the dynamics were. But by the same token, you just have to go to work, right? So I remember having, you know, conversations with our board saying, look, guys, 50 PE at this size, it's just not sustainable, right? So I don't know the, the, the outcome or the answer, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to sell the insurance business. We're going to we're going to get into life sciences. We're going to get into aviation. We're going to focus on faster growth industries. So, I, I think I think you 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 sometimes you can't dwell at thirty thousand feet at macro. Sometimes when you've got a lot of pressure, you just have to go chop wood, right? You you just have to go 
break it down into just very micro pieces that you can begin to attack and just try to buy yourself, uh, you know, as, as, as much time. Really, you know, what I would say, Jacob, look, and to a certain extent, without the financial crisis, I probably wouldn't have written the book and we wouldn't be having this, this <laughs> argument right now. It's like, you know, we were running a play, the play was kind of working, but, you know, what you get is, you, you, you know, you not only had GE at a macro scale, but you had to deal with 9-11, the financial crisis, COVID, and all those things. And those two things really made, you know, made the job even tougher. Yeah, no, it's but you got to break it down. Easy. And what what are the actions you can get people working on, and and just go to work? There are a lot of leaders who listen and watch the show, mid level and senior level leaders. What is the best piece of leadership advice that you have learned during the course of your career that you think other people should be applying in their careers and in their lives? Mm, gosh, I'd say um, study how people work. Hmm. In other in other words. If you're running an organization, know what a developer does, know what a salesperson does. Know, you don't have to do their work, but, but be able to kind of envision how everybody in your organization does their job, right? How, how they go, what, what tools do they use? How do they work together? What metrics move them? And, and I frequently, I, I'll go to a CEO's office and I'm always looking at their wall to say, what connects them to the frontline worker? And if I walk in an office and it's just artwork and statues and crap like that, then I, I don't believe what the value statement says. I'm looking for like a picture where they were walking the floor with a nurse or a picture of a jet engine or something mm -hmm. like that. So I got that advice from a guy named John Opie early in my career. He was one of my mentors. And he just said, Jeff, look, no matter how big you get in the company, no matter how big you get in your career, know how the people that work for you do their work. Hmm. Well, I think in your book, you talk about one of the reasons um, why you became CEO is because you learned how fridges work, right? I mean, compressors. Can, can you share that story? Because I think it fits very well with what you're saying. Yeah, now. no, I, I was running the appliance business and in services, we had to repair 3 million compressors. It was the biggest product recall in the history of the company up until that time. And so we were gonna to have to re replace all these compressors. I made the entire leadership team, including myself, learn how to fix a compressor. So I would go out every other week and sit in somebody's home and it was a really hard repair and I was horrible at it, but it gave me a sense for how you know people uh, did their work. And then, you know, I, we, you and I talked about it earlier. I'm in the, uh, we had to go meet with Welch every month. And, and uh, the time when the statistician got lockjaw, uh, you know, we had to explain to him why the reserve needed to be $500 million instead of $400 million. And he was ripped, right? And he's, he's challenging why, 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 why? And I'm saying, well, in the reserve, it said the repair would take 105 minutes, but it really is going to take 115 minutes. And he says, that's just because the people that work for you are so lazy. They, they don't want to do. And I said, no, like, let me tell you, I've fixed 20 compressors and here's what I learned. And he, he stood back and I explained to him, like, here's why it takes a long time. Here's why it's hard. And so not only did I get grounded, but it, it gave me a sense of domain that frequently leaders need to be effective in, in driving change. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of the classic ivory tower problem, right? It's uh, yeah. getting in on the ground floor. No, I love that story. I think it also ties well into the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is ego and hubris. You've worked with a lot of and know a lot of leaders over the years who have tremendous egos. And I think you touch on this in your book, but what what's your thought on on ego and can it lead to the downfall of a leader? Yeah, look, so you, you have to have an opinion, a good opinion of yourself to lead again to the, the point you and I were just saying, which is, you know, being a good CEO, it's a life of criticism. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, everybody says, you know, you make so much money and that's true, right? There's many reasons not to feel sorry for any CEO, <laughs> but it's, it's really living with criticism. And, and the only way to weather criticism is to have your own belief that you're okay, right? And, and that's called ego. 
I, I would separate that from arrogance because arrogance is death, right? You can, you can be a little bit er e egotistical and have a high opinion of yourself while still not allowing kind of arrogance. In other words, I, I know that everything I'm doing is perfect and therefore I don't have to get better. Uh, I, I draw the line there in that you, you can never lose the desire to get better, to improve, to do things that uh, others aren't doing. And, and so that's where ego gets you in trouble. Hmm. One of the other things that you talk about in your book is why leaders should never fall in love with an idea. Uh, and I think this is something a lot of people struggle with. Can you share why that's so important? Do you have any stories or examples? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I in venture capital, you kind of see it every day, which things that look good on a PowerPoint chart, frequently when you get into, um, you know, uh, the real elements of how work takes place, uh, they fall apart. I, I'll give you an example in, in healthcare, right? One of the most, like, if you, if you were in the healthcare industry, everything looks like a good idea, right? It, it's just so massive. There's so many technologies that can help patients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But unless somebody pays, right? In, unless an insurance company pays or the government pays or an employer, an employer pays, it fails. It fails. So one of the first questions I ask in, in every healthcare review isn't like, that looks neat. What a great technology. It's who pays, right? And that's, that's where you can see wave after wave of good ideas that frequently fail. You know, COVID, Jacob, advanced lots of technology. So today you think about telehealth and you say, my God, that is amazing. And COVID made it. But for 20 years, telehealth was a graveyard of investors, right? It, because nobody paid for it. No, nobody offered it as a service. Nobody paid for it. But suddenly when COVID hit, all the insurance companies said, oh, you know what? We're going to pay for telehealth today. So that's the difference between being a good, you know, having a good idea versus being a good business. What was it like having these regular dinners uh, with the CEOs? You uh, used to have regular dinners with the CEOs of American Express, with Johnson & Johnson, IBM, uh, Pepsi. And as I was reading that in the book, it, rem it reminded me a lot of, um, you ever see the show The Sopranos? <laughs> or, or, or like the the mob bosses yeah. get together and and like it's an empty restaurant and it's just like six people sitting yeah, there. Yeah, no, it was a little bit like that. So we met at each other's headquarters, and uh, you know, so IBM, G, all of us had you know kind of kitchens and fancy dining rooms and things like that, and we rotated every quarter. It would be a different time, and it was. Um, you know, usually in The Sopranos, you're planning how someone is going to die. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like a Lonely Hearts Club, right? You would walk in and say, you know, tell me about this person. I'm thinking about them from, from, for a board member. What do you think? Or how do you compensate your senior leaders? Or what do you think of China or things like that? And it, you could be completely unplugged. No one was ever showing off for anybody else. You could talk about like things that were, you know, inevitably one of us would be in the barrel, you know, at that time. So like, what were they going through? How could we be helpful? And you just need, you know, you just need people to talk to. It's a lonely job. It's a job of criticism. And so, you know, you just need people to talk to. How do you decide who you surround yourself with? Because I think a lot of leaders could benefit from having that kind of a inner circle. So how, how did yeah, you look, guys specifically one... get together? Yeah, no, we, we uh, Ken Chenault and I started it. We were both taking over at about the same time. We were geographically close. We just grew to like each other over time. And, and, and I would say, you know, everybody needs to put on their schedule the ability to see people out of sequence. So I always made it a point to call people or to see people when I didn't need anything. Hmm. And, and I think if you're talking to somebody when you don't need a favor, or don't need an order, or don't want them to do something, you just get to know them better. And, and over time, you find out who you can learn from, who you're compatible with. And, and that's something that, you know, I, I always coach CEOs to do that, but I, I don't see them doing it nearly enough. And, uh, and it's, really, it's really essential to build, you know, a, a hefty dose of connections outside of your company. When you look back at your time, uh, your career as CEO, what do you think the 
biggest mistake is that you made during your career and what did you learn from it? Oh, gosh, you know, I would say one was uh, not resetting the company right after 9-11, you know, and, and I think the lesson there is every now and then when you're leading a big organization, you need to allow yourself just profound thought, you know, in other words, we worked on strategy and we did that, but I'm not sure we were ever really profound enough to say, okay, this has to change completely, or we can reset completely, or we can, and, and I just think you get trapped by momentum and versus stepping back. So one I would say is don't get trapped by momentum, allow yourself time to think really profound thoughts. And the other one was, um, and I blame myself for both these, by the way, um, whenever I was around people I trusted, it didn't matter how bad things were, we did fine. Hmm. And whenever I let my guard down and allowed people I didn't trust be in a senior position or on the board, inevitably bad things happened. And, and I now see many companies outside GE and each one has people you don't trust. You know, it's just, we, we like to say we're pure and it's not us and we have a great culture, but I guarantee you, and by trust, I mean, not loyalty. I mean, people that put the company first, right? You, the people that I trust were people that put the company ahead of themselves, none of us. And, and I kick myself in the ass every day that I let my guard down because all of it had a consequence as time goes on. One of the things that I thought was actually pretty interesting in your book when you talk about mistakes is you said you wish you would have said, I don't know more often. Uh, is there a particular situation that comes to mind or a particular story where you wish you would have said, I don't know? Yeah, look, in, in um, the financial crisis, uh, not cutting the dividend was existential. And... You know, I, I said I wouldn't do it. And what I really should have said is I need to keep watching what's going on to see how it goes. And, you know, because we were in the early days of the financial crisis and it just got worse and worse and worse. And, and you know, that's just one example. But hmm. I, I think it's OK not to fill space. And, yeah. and sometimes the best answer is just, uh, just, I don't know. You know, I, I look at the automotive industry probably a decade ago uh, when, when the CEO of GM was asked, what do you think about electric vehicles? She was allowed to say, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to study it. Right. Yeah. And that bought her time to today say, we're going to go all in by 2030 or whatever the right answer is. So, you know, sometimes you, you, you know the right answer, but you, you're at the wrong time. And a way, a good way to buy yourself time is just to say, I don't know. So I just want to ask you two more questions before I just have some fun rapid fire questions for you. Uh, and one of them is your process for making decisions, because I think a lot of leaders, th that's one of the things that, that differentiates, differentiates their career, right? I mean, it's what makes them stand yeah. out is the decisions they make about their business, um, their lives. Do you have a process or questions that you ask yourself to be able to make better decisions? Yeah, look, I think the one thing that's in the book is that how many we had to make. And, and you know, it, it had to do with the environment and the nature of the company. But I think, you know, like I like I like to make decisions in a crowded room. I like to have lots of different voices and people around. I, I always kind of draw kind of like a risk reward in my head and and think about okay you know when does the decision on the right side of the risk line from the standpoint of you know every decision has good things and bad things associated with it so i i would try to hear the bad things and the good things and try to understand when the good things really outweighed the bad things and mm -hmm. and so a combination of those you know, being in a crowded room with lots of voices and my own kind of mental risk reward equation, some of it data driven, some of it judgment, you know, go down the list. That would be, um, you know, kind of how and when we would push the button and make a decision. And then I, I 
I just didn't dwell on things after I did them. You know, I, I didn't I, I didn't dwell on, you know, like, oh, my God, people are going to criticize me or this could go wrong. I just kind of marched on and said we did the best we could with the information we had. We'll live with mm-hmm. the consequences. And last question for you before we get to the rapid fire. And it's uh, the last sentence from your book. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, and the last sentence of your book is, you said, your career is going to have bad days and good days, but believe it or not, you need the bad days because they make you a better leader. Um, can you talk about how those bad days, the, the tough situations, the tough choices make you a better leader and why it's so important for everybody to experience those? I would say two things. Is you're, you're never really tested until you have to see things... Um, in their worst time, when, when you don't know the right answer, when you're in moments of crisis, you learn the most about yourself and you learn the most about the people around you. So that's one element of the, what the bad days bring. I, I think it also brings perspective, which mm-hmm. is, you know, like, like it's you, you take more joy in normal. You know, everybody that's been through COVID Let's say before they went into COVID, they they thought every day was okay, right? And then COVID hits and things are pure crap for 24 months. And then a normal day is going to feel joyful. You know? It's just going to feel joyful because you actually know you, you've reset the bar. And I think if people are joyful on a normal day, you're going to you're going to be more you're going to be happier with your career your your company's culture is going to be better people aren't going to be burdened you know that's that's what i you know that that's why i said the what i said all right now just a couple a couple fun rapid fire questions for you uh, starting off with what has been your most embarrassing work moment oh gosh um most embarrassing work moment. When I was a salesman, uh, uh, a sales manager, one of my friends called and said that he was Jack Welch. He actually <laughs> had a copy, mocked up a copy of a stationery and said, uh, Dear Jeff, I'd like you to come to dinner in Fairfield. I, I was two years with the company and you know, I kind of had my secretary get plane reservations and things like that. Oh, and man. Said, I want to go see Jack Welch and everybody who was in on the joke thought that was quite funny. Like I said, you know, The Office was always one of my favorite shows on, on NBC and things are only funny because they're true, that, that those, that's the way people actually act in yeah. field offices, but that was probably <laughs> my most embarrassing uh, work moment. Who's the best band of all time? You know, I'm a huge Almond Brothers fan. Um, and you know, I, my daughter's 34, but she's in the seventies, uh, she's in the seventies rock, just like I am. So I would say, uh, that's my fave. Best book or resource that, that you recommend for leaders to check out, uh, not including your book, of course. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in military history. Uh, I I'd say any of the anthologies about Gettysburg or uh, a guy named Rick uh, Atkinson did a trilogy about World War II, the first one of the trilogy, you know, because, you know, military battles are kind of a study in failure, like who fails the least wins the, wins the war and who pivots the best tends to be uh, successful. And in and, and the Rick Atkinson trilogy, basically in North Africa, the U.S. Army was terrible. But by the time D-Day uh, came in, they had better leaders, better training, uh, better everything. And so I always think those are valuable for uh, business leaders. If you could have lunch with anyone alive or dead, who would it be? Um, gosh, I, I would say uh, I would say Joe Biden. You, you know, Biden. in other words, I, I'd love to pick his brain and. I'd love to offer a few thoughts in a constructive way. Uh, you know, I think it's such an important time for the country. And uh, yeah, I would probably probably uh, say that. I thought of another embarrassing story. Uh, I was in Europe and I was CEO and I was giving a speech 
And I went to a fancy, you know, like I grew up without much money and I went to a fancy shoe store and bought some shoes and I put them on and I got up to give the speech and I noticed that the shoes were purple. So the old purple <laughs> shoes, <laughs> the old European purple shoes. That uh, was a good one as well. I like that. All right. And last uh, two for you. What are you most proud of? Oh, you know, G was a great global company. Uh, I, I thought we not only won in global markets, but we were a great representative of the United States and of, of our of our company. And in the era we were there, I would say nobody did it better than we did in, in a very important way around the world. And looking back, uh, how do you wish people would think about you, remember you, describe you uh, as the former CEO of GE? I uh, love the company, love the people, try it as best. I love it. Well, Jeff, where can people go to learn more about you, your book, anything that you want to mention for people to check out? I'd love for people to read the book. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn as well, Jacob. So I'd say those two places. And uh, uh, if you want to start a company, if you have a good idea, let me know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe you should mention what you're doing now in case. Uh, yeah, no, I'm a, a venture partner at NEA. So do a lot of healthcare investing, but uh, really enjoy my time with entrepreneurs and uh, really a very meaningful life. It's funny to go from like CEO of such a big global company to working with, uh, you know, scrappy entrepreneurs. Uh, Jeff, it's joyful. It's yeah. Really joyful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking Thanks, time Jacob. out of your day. I really appreciate it. Uh, my guest again, everybody, has been Jeff Immelt. You can check out his book. It's called Hot Seat, What I Learned Leading a Great American Company. I had a chance to read it. So many stories. We didn't even get to like 90% of the stuff, but there are some really awesome stories in there. So make sure to check it out and I will see all of you next week. Thanks for watching. And if you want more content just like this, please remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, my wife and I have a brand new podcast where we talk about entrepreneurship and how you can become your own boss. If you want to learn what you need to do, you can check us out at byobpodcast.com. That's byobbeyourownbosspodcast.com.